y'all what's up everybody once again it's brand man sean and i got a very special guest for you guys today that is ruslan this guy is an indie rapper who's built a sustainable fan base and actually has his own record label and been able to transfer some of his fan base to a new artist and is now building that artist up to be even bigger than he was he has some business insight some unique spotify strategies if you actually watched the other video i did drop in that clip from this video and he has a very unique branding scenario that a lot of rappers don't have to go through so i'm excited to show you guys this interview because i know it's going to bring in hella value Check it out. Let's hop into it. And I have a very special guest for you guys today. This man has been rapping for a good minute. Um, he's been building a solid fan base. And not only does he have a, a solid fan base, he has an indie label as well. You own the label. Is that right? Yes, sir. King's Dream Entertainment based in beautiful San Diego, California. A little boutique label I've been doing uh, since 2014. All right. All right. And... Obviously, um, I mean, there, that's him talking. So without further ado, it's Russ Land. Did I say that name right? You did not. It's Russ Ruslan, Land. but it's okay. Ruslan? Ruslan. Man. God. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, so I want to get this out of the way, man. Real, uh, real quick. Like, I know there has to be people out there who say you look like Russ or, like, see Russ at all and just mis mistake you for Russ. You ever got something like that? Yeah, you know, uh, first of all, as a white hip hop artist, uh, it's always whoever the latest white rapper is. <laughs> so, exactly. you know, initially it was like Eminem, Eminem. This is like when I first started rapping. It was like Eminem. Then it evolved to uh, probably like, was that 2012? Oh, you look just like Macklemore. Like, I, I look nothing like Macklemore. You know what I'm saying? Like, at all. That's tough. And so now, now it's like, oh, bro, you look like Russ. And it's like, because we're white and we have brown hair like oh, you know, russ is like half a foot shorter than me you know what i mean like <laughs> different eyes different shape face like but that's you know that just goes to show it's like uh it's, it's just people want to just simplify you but no i don't take offense to it i think russ is an amazing artist uh i i really appreciate what he's done in terms of his indie grind uh the deal he landed with Columbia. I think it's great. So yeah, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a fan of the Rush, bro. So I don't take it. The Macklemore thing, I wasn't a super big fan of because it was like yeah. straight pop rap. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I didn't like yeah. that. I don't even understand that comparison. <laughs> but though, I, hey, I, I, I sidetracked this a bit. But man, they this um this dude's been not only is he grinding, been building a legitimate fan base. He has a he's he's a Christian, right? That that's and that's a very interesting place to be as far as branding and we're going to talk about that the fact that there is this thing about being pegged as a christian rapper um there's already the regular hard indie rapper grind there's a lot of things that come with that but i feel like he's one of the people who's doing it successfully um no matter what stage you might be looking at it so um really man i want to start here with you um as far as being a christian rapper right what made you decide that you wanted to allow yourself to be pegged as a Christian rapper? That's a, that's, that's a great question. There, there was nothing, there was no one specific thing. It was, I was a Christian and I made hip hop. I didn't even know what Christian hip hop was initially. Uh, I just got radically saved and had an encounter with God. And I was like, yo, like this has to, affect how I make art, you know, and it had, I can't do some of the things I used to love to do. And some of the things I thought were corny, you know, I just naturally started doing like talking about God more, you know, I also had the framework, like, like a lot of what hip hop was to me at the time in terms of Tupac and DMX was really my first on ramp to even hearing about God in a, in a non corny way. And so wow. I, I didn't have no problem talking about God in my music. Now, as that evolved and it's turned more into a career um then you discover that there's this thing called christian hip-hop and, and this, this entire world that kind of operates outside of regular hip-hop but you know, is intertwined now more and more and so it wasn't like i just i didn't have any reservations to it because this is just who i am like i'm going to talk about my faith but i'm also going to talk about you know, becoming successful. I'm talking about my family. I'm going to talk about the struggles that I've had coming up as an immigrant in the United States and not knowing my, you know, English as a language for a while. So you hear a full scope of that. And 
for me, I don't mind attaching myself to being a Christian because that's what I am. People want to call me a Christian rapper. I'm like, all right, whatever. You know what I'm saying? Like, you listen to my music, you think it's Christian rap. Cool. Like, I'm not, I'm not going to deny that uh, because I think if people actually check for the music, they'll know that it's quality. And a lot of people have some type of faith background, you know? Right. So what I, what's different about my music is it's not like overtly beating people over the head with the Bible. You know what I'm saying? Like it's different. It's, it's, it's lifestyle music. And I think people that, that honestly give it an open ear for the most part, like, oh, this is dope. Like this is fly and they, and they rock with it. That's what's up. I can definitely agree with that. It's not like you were beating somebody over the head with um, your beliefs or anything like that. Whenever I hear the music, I mean, you have some songs where, okay, it, it might be in the chorus, right? You might be talking about God, but honestly, when you got people like Kanye and so like you hear God so much in music, it doesn't even sound like a, like you're preaching or anything. And it doesn't really go too much deeper. I mean, you have some, some songs where you go a little bit deeper, but, but generally speaking, it's, it's just regular hip hop. Uh, when I hear it, uh, I probably wouldn't have even thought too much about that. If I hadn't seen things where you were mentioned as a Christian rapper. Um, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think Kanye Chance have completely, you know, like desensitized the public's um, perception of Christians, you yeah. know, like what used to be like, oh, that's whack. And then like, I think Jesus Walks was a big moment uh, for for Christians and hip hop or whatever you want to call it. And then obviously with Chance now, who's been open and, and, and labeled himself a Christian rapper, which I think is very, very fascinating. Um, yeah. I think it's changed the, the palette of the public, you know, like it's incorporated something different versus like if we, if we flash back 10 years ago and it was like the soldier boy trap era when trap first exploded, like you didn't really, there was no real balance, you know, besides mm -hmm. Kanye, like there was no real balance. Now that I feel like there's more balance to Kendrick's, the, the chances, the Kanye's, who are more overt about their faith view, it right. makes it, it makes the, the public more open to it, I think. And that's a beautiful thing. And I'm not mad at any of those guys and I enjoy all their music. So, oh. hey, well, obviously, man, you you found success regardless of what people think. And like not, you know, I'm sure you want, you got a lot of building that you want to do. So, but you're finding success and you, you've been growing your fan base right now. On Spotify, you're like 73,000 monthly listeners, right? That's a good amount monthly, especially, right? That's a, a lot of artists want that for one song, but, but it says you have that monthly. How have you been building your Spotify fan base? That's a great question. I think understanding the algorithms in terms of what's happening with Spotify. Spotify is doing some amazing stuff. Spotify is essentially, I, I feel like, I don't want to say competing with SoundCloud, but they're impeding on that space that SoundCloud yeah. was in by releasing those Vanity Matrix. Yeah. And I think, I think it's actually really cool. So understanding the, 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 the actual algorithm, followers to plays, how many followers, if you have X amount of followers and they all listen to your song the first day it comes out, that's going to set off bells in their algorithm. Mm -hmm. And so pushing people to the Spotify, pushing people to follow, uh, pre-saving, dropping releases four weeks, you know, putting a release up four weeks out, telling people to pre-save it, pre-save it, pre-save it, building hype and prep work around the release. Also dropping singles that then go on a project and then those single streams transfer over uh, by using the same um, I, I, ICRC numbers, I forget what those numbers are, but you can do I a super, yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. I did a video about it on, on how to transfer your numbers from like TuneCore to DistroKid. So I think just using the platforms natively, which I know we hear about, you know, from guys like Gary Vee, all that kind of stuff, but yeah. using the platforms natively, understanding what it is. And if you, like, I got an artist friend of mine, I did a whole video about this, but I got an artist friend of mine who's, uh, he's actually my, my artist's older brother, and he had like, I don't know, like a hundred followers or something crazy, but his first song dropped and it was at like 70, 80,000 streams, listens. And it was because all those hundred followers went and listened to it, they shared it. And that set off bells in their system. They then Spotify playlisted based on their algorithm. And now his monthly listeners are through the roof. Like I think he's at like 20,000 monthly listeners started with a hundred followers one song out that has like 80,000, 100,000 streams. And it was because those initial 100 followers went crazy when a song dropped. All right, great. So I don't know, I probably haven't mentioned this in a video, but one thing that you're saying, which is great. And I remember sitting on um, when 
my first introduction to really how Spotify works actually was like a meeting with people at Spotify and they were and like a few of the playlisters and they were telling me she was like they basically they listen to the uh, well they they watch these lists they watch the numbers yes somebody might have the power to put something on their playlist but after that it's all numbers if it's not working they're going to take it off it's going to lose traction and they and they just say and eh, no we don't want this on the list they want the playlist to perform but on the other side like she mentioned Khalid right um it w- a song on a playlist the, pl- the song is popping and they see literally metrics. Okay, what's this song? They might not even heard the song. They just see that it's performing and then they add it. Let's try it on this playlist. Oh, it's still outperforming on this playlist. Let's try it on another playlist. So what you're talking about in terms of getting everybody that follows you to go crazy on it in one period of time, that spike will at least get that attention. And I think it's great you mentioned that because I don't think I've mentioned it before. Um, and I know, and I don't see too many people talk about that part with that being said i would love to hear you talk about your specific album release strategies that you typically use because you talk about pre-save and then there's a few other things i'm sure you do what do you typically do leading up to the project so you can get that boost yeah that's a great question and just to go back to the spotify thing one of the things that's really interesting about spotify is that i do feel like it's level the playing field so like you said if you got a hot record even if you got a hundred followers I almost feel like those hundred are at an advantage because if you can get those hundred to really engage, listen to music, share the music, they'll, they'll set off bells. But what, what Spotify does have, and this is where I feel like it levels the playing field, is they check for their skip rates. So if my song gets added to a yeah. playlist, like we got like the Blaze playlist. Shout out to Marty from Social Club. He added a song I have called Wait. It was already on some other playlist. He added it to a place and then he hit me. He was like, bro, like your song is the least skip song on the entire playlist. So then that set off the bells, they put it on a bunch of more playlists, mm. right? It, so that's how it snowballs and compounds because now you can't just be, it's not just about clout and buzz and hype. You right. actually have to have great music that then they can see if people are skipping over this song. Yeah, You know what I mean? So if yeah. your song is quality, people aren't skipping through it. Maybe they're even going back, maybe they're adding it. All of that stuff helps, and that's where it kind of levels the playing field because major labels can't just be like, we're just going to buy everybody's attention because you could get on all those playlists, but if that dead joint ain't knocking and people are skipping over it, it don't really mean anything. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, I, I love that. Yeah. Um, so roll out, album rollout yeah, strategy. Roll out. Uh, I, I did, we did, for I just put out a record with my artist, Paul Russell, super amazing artist from, he he's actually goes to Cornell University. Yeah, he's, he's actually from Atlanta originally, uh-huh. oh. uh, goes to Cornell University now. He's a senior, amazing, really, really dope songwriter, producer. Um, basically what we did is we announced him as an artist with a single. We started rolling out just singles. We spent a few months dropping singles with music videos. The singles went natively on all the streaming platforms. With, and then the music videos obviously went on YouTube. We kind of built that hype, announced the actual album with a kind of tentative release date. iTunes pre-orders were, actually the iTunes pre-orders had the release date and the Spotify pre-save and then we had merch through our own web store. And essentially we use our merch pre-orders and our direct pre-orders to fund the records, if you will. So if we drop a record, you know, and we do a couple hundred pre- pre-orders directly from our stuff. It's usually attached to like a shirt or a hoodie bundle. That really funds the record. That pays for the mastering, that pays for the music videos, pays for whatever little marketing we want to do. And so that's that's something I learned from Seth Godin was like, let the people fund your records. A lot of artists want to come out the gate and spend $10,000 on a record. And it's like, you probably shouldn't spend that much on a record unless you have some type of infrastructure uh, or some type of support system to at least make your money back. So our budgets are kind of determined by how much people rock with them. So there's certain, like if I'm dropping a solo record, I'll probably do anywhere from three to 500 pre-orders directly from our website. This is over like a six to eight week campaign. You know, you do the math on that. I have a bit more wiggle room versus a new artist that I might sign. He might only do a hundred pre-orders. Those same pre-orders we attach, you know, to the budget, to where the money comes from to pay for mastering, to, to, to pay for music videos, to pay for the merch, to pay for all these things. And that initial 
prefrontal load up of hype and buzz and excitement, we give people maybe the record early if they pre-order from us. So yeah, it's dropping on Spotify on October 10th, but if you pre-order and screen shoot me the record, we'll send you the, the link, you know, two weeks early, three weeks early. So now people are excited about it, they're talking about it, they're sharing about it. And it might only be 100 people, 150 people, but those 150 people are super, super, super activated. And, and it just kind of snowballs. And then when the record drops, then there's already been some hype and some buzz. Hopefully you release singles and there's some hype around it. And, uh, and then, you know, if the music is good, Spotify will use Spotify, Apple Music. They'll usually, they'll usually look out, you know, and, and, and help put it on playlists and stuff like that. But, so how do you, you talk about these pre-orders? Just to clarify, pre-orders are they're ordering the music pre-order or they're ordering like merch like you said and then the pre-order is, is the bundle with the music in it both both so they're usually pre-ordering the album I, we, so we do a digital c digital cd bundle right they get the digital early and then they get the cd bundle and then we do like a cd t-shirt bundle and a t you know and then sometimes we'll do we'll even do like a cd hoodie bundle so there'll be three bundles I, i'm actually thinking about completely getting rid of just the cds in general after seeing travis scott like attached merch you know to his thing and just doing like look if you want a physical cd you have to pre-order a 20 dollars t-shirt you know what i mean and and then pushing those margins up a bit you know i think because if it's like a shirt and a cd you can sell it for more so i think i think i might go that direction but yeah usually it's cd digital and physical then it's cd and t-shirt and then maybe there's a cd and hoodie option okay Got you. Dope. So how are people, well, how is in your system, are you guys developing a fan base? I know yours has been a sense of, I mean, you've been, you've been in it for a minute, but now you have Paul Russell. So I'm sure you already kind of put him in a sense of a system of exposure, but these are pre-orders. People are actually buying stuff. How'd you get to the point where you have fans who would actually buy a reasonable amount of merch from you? That's a great question. Yeah, I mean, for me, people got to understand, like, I've been doing this for a decade plus. I've only been full time for a little over three years, but I've been consistently releasing music. Uh, we was putting out stuff as a, as a group called The Breaks, Me and Belief, back in 07, 08. And then that evolved into us doing solo stuff. That evolved into me launching the label. Uh, I was a part of a collective of Belief and Gives called Dream Junkie. So I've been doing this for a very, very long time. But I think it's, for me, I've always focused on the depth. Like, I think I focused on the depth and the things that have made me different. How can I be different? How can I stand out? You know, so early on when everybody was doing the, you know, whatever, the Soldier Boy rap, the auto-tune rap, you know, in 07, 08, 09, uh, the Lil Wayne era, really, like, we yeah. was super duper boom bap. Like, we was super duper polar opposite of what everybody yeah. was doing. So we had way less fans but we had more depth with those fans, you know? And then we did right. an Indiegogo campaign. The very first thing that kind of really popped off for us was we did this Indiegogo campaign and we raised, uh, this is 2011, and we raised like $10,000 just doing a crowdsourcing campaign. But that entire year, we had dropped a song, a remix song a week, uh, where we did, uh, people would email us or, tech or tweet us and be like, yo, remix, the new Drake song. And we do like our own version of the Drake song, whatever hottest song was out, we'd flip and do our own version of it. And so we did that for a full year. And then in that same year, we dropped three mixtapes. We dropped an uh, EP and then we dropped this album that we did the, the Indiegogo for. And so at that point, once there was so much hype and buzz around it, then people started coming alongside of what we were doing because they just saw the excitement that people had on a grassroots level. And so then we were able to level up and uh, like we had Andy Minio on the mixtape early on. We had a bunch of artists kind of in our niche on that same mixtape just because they were just excited to work with us. And then the album, we ended up getting Lecrae on the album. To, this 2011 is called Never Arrived. You can still look it up. I look totally different. In it. Uh, oh. <laughs> we had a joint with, with, with Lecrae. We had a joint with Shad. I don't know if you know who Shad is. He beat Drake out for a Juno Award in Canada. He's an amazing hip hop artist. He like does a thing on. He actually just put out an album. So we had Shad. So they were these people in our similar niche as ours that just was rocking with us, yeah. hopped on the records because they saw the buzz. And that then we then leveled up some more because people who were in fans of theirs became fans of ours. Nice. And then the following year, we killed it with this circuit called NACA. NACA, if you don't know what NACA is, NACA is the National Association for Campus Activities. It's a huge nonprofit. They put together these campus uh, conferences where colleges go to book talent. It's one of the, like, the mm. biggest revenue streams for a lot of entertainers. I'm talking comedians, magicians. So we killed it at NACA 2011. 
going into 2012, we had like 30 college shows booked. So here we are, these Christian dudes that are playing non-Christian colleges and then also hopping on shows. Uh, you know, Lecrae did the Man Up Conference in Atlanta that year, 2012. It was like 3,500 people. We got to open. We did like a 10-minute set. He did uh, Francis Chan, uh, Reach Life Institute in L.A. Yo, come out, rock with us. Cool. Came out, you know, 1,500 people. Stand, meet every single person that wants to buy a piece of merch, shake every single hand, take every single picture, kiss every single baby. You know what I'm saying? And then it's yeah. like you look up and you're like, yo, all my numbers doubled. You know what I'm saying? And yeah. then you build those relationships. We was able to then go back. Over. So then the, the following year, I went and did a tour with Fonsworth Bentley. All those college shows we did in 2012, I, I maintained half of those relationships, turned around and did like a 10 city college tour with Fonsworth Bentley. Uh, and so that helped me tap into some of his. So there's like a lot of like intentional stuff I was doing that I really didn't even know I was doing. I was just trying to survive. Like I knew I wanted to do music full time. We was yeah. like in debt. We were trying to get out of debt. I was a newlywed. And dude, I was just going for it. And it just kind of keep compounding. And then you look up and you're like, yo, like I got a little following. Like I got a fan base. And it's that whole thousand super fans, right? I knew, I know I have a thousand people that really rock with me. How can I just communicate to those thousand people that, yo, like, I need y'all to pre-order this album. I need y'all to buy this merch. I need y'all to come to this show. And then that compounds to locally, like we did House of Blues in San Diego. We sold 500 tickets, real, like, hard ticket sales in San Diego. And we're independent. You know what I'm saying? We did 200 in L.A. I think we did, like, 75 in Atlanta. These aren't crazy numbers, but they're real numbers that, that I can build on top of. And then I can take and plug a new artist into. And I say, okay, cool. I got 20,000 Instagram followers. We announced Paul Russell within a matter of a few months. He built 2,000 Instagram followers, real followers. His engagement is crazy. Like he's getting like four or 500 likes a photo. And mm -hmm. so 10% of my audience is willing to give a shot to anybody that I'm kind of putting on, you know what I'm saying? And, and kind of compound on that. And now I'm in a place where like, I don't, I don't need to rap for the rest of my life because I'm around these kids that are freaks, man. These kids, John Keith, Paul Russell, they're 21 years old and yeah. they're, amazing like i don't know if it's something in the water or what the <laughs> protein they're just so good bro yeah. like they're so they're so good and so now it's just like channeling it through them and helping build up other artists dope 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 man it's it's, it's so much to unpack there man so i'm let me see well you talked about the fact that y'all got on the naka conference say the conference again naka 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 look if you if you make clean music it doesn't have to be like squeaky clean, but if you make clean music and if there's, a, if there's something to make you different, if you do spoken word poetry, that was our end. We did hip hop, pop, we did positive hip hop and spoken word. So we did spoken word poetry. So we do a poem here and there. Dude, that, that world is amazing. Or if you can do like something of a novelty act where like say you're like a rapper who does magic tricks. I know that sounds cheesy, but like those be the things that you can really plug into something like NACA and kill it on the show and and this is where like a lot of comedians got their start um and i just like i just did a, the last one and um uh chrisette michelle was there you know what i'm saying like there'd be there'd be like low you know like bc level celebrities that still are trying to like pop in naca because those colleges have budgets every single year that are allocated for throwing concerts and events. A lot of people don't know that. I knew that because I was on a college board throwing concerts and events. And they'd be like, you got $10,000 for the year. And I was like, oh, I'm booking all the homies. You know what I mean? So I was booking like Ahmad, Fourth Avenue Jones, LA Symphony. I was booking all these in un indie underground artists. And then I was like, yo, colleges have money. I don't want to play churches. That's, that's kind of my thing. It's like, I'm not big on, I, I don't mind playing churches, but I like playing colleges. I like playing house of blues clubs. And so I was like, this is an easy on-ramp for me to build non-Christian audiences, like non-Christian fan bases and expose myself to people that don't have my worldview, but I know that they would like my music, you know, if it was presented. Dope. So what's that stand for again for the people who are watching so they could go make that actionable for themselves? Yeah, N-A-C-A, -A, uh, National Association of Campus Activities. Bet, bet. Appreciate that. Huge gem. You already dropped quite a few already, man. I want to... um. Really get into your music for a second, right? So I've heard a lot of different things and it might be it might be indicative of your Christian uh, worldview or it might be indicative of just where we are in music, for instance. Like I know your music, you might have, you, you mentioned having a wife and stuff like that, right? That's not necessarily stuff we're hearing in 2000s, right? But maybe we're hearing that in 2000s Christian music. I don't necessarily know. Right. So what 
there's that and a few other things that you mentioned. Where do you see music going? Is it just the fact that people are more open to just different type of relationships or having a, 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 a main girl or a wife? Is that cool now? Or is that just more just who you are in? I, I don't know I, exactly what I'm asking. You get what I'm saying, though? Yeah. No, I think it's both. I think, one, bro, being married is so lit. Like, I've been married 10 years. It's freaking awesome. Like, okay. it's, it's, I, I, I have, my wife is incredible. Like, I, I have an amazing wife. I have an amazing, uh, we've been able to build our life in a way where, like, we, we, we do what we want, you know what I'm saying? Because we spent time working and it's so cool to do it with somebody else. Yeah. And so I think one, yeah, like it's who I am. It's really who I am. Like I, I, I love being married. I love having my, you, I don't know if you saw my son in here before we got started. I had yeah, to yeah. sit him away because he was knocking over equipment. Uh, <laughs> I got a, I got a son who's about to be four. So like, I enjoy being married. I enjoy, I enjoy the family life. And here's the deal. Here's the thing that people confuse about uh, faith. Like people think that like, yo, God is this killjoy in the sky. He wants to take away all the fun, you know what I mean? And not let me do anything I want. And it's like, no, bro, like God is the complete opposite. Like God is a loving father who wants the best for his kids. And if we look at the research for um, marriage, if we look at the, what's, what's an ideal environment for kids to be brought up in what, 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 where do we find the most contentment? It's not in running around and, and, and having, you know, multiple partners and, you know, uh, you know, having promiscuous sex, like the, very little contentment in that. And, and, and I, and, and I grew up in a family where I don't know about you, but like my, I was raised by a single mother. I grew up, you know, adultery in the household. Uh, my mother and father split when I was like six after we moved to America as immigrants. So imagine moving to another country as a refugee immigrant, not knowing the language. Six months later, your dad leaves because he finds out that, you know, they, they've been cheating on each other back in Russia. And it, it was just a mess, bro. And yeah. so I grew up in a very, very, uh, toxic environment. Russians love to drink alcohol. You know what I'm saying? And I don't, I don't have a problem with alcohol. I, I don't drink. I don't smoke. I'm super into being married. I'm, I'm like the, the hip hop Ned Flanders. And on, <laughs> on the surface, <laughs> like, like that may look cheesy, right? That may look cheesy, but people meet me, my, my, specifically my, my, my buddies who aren't following God or my buddies from that, that are st still got one foot in the streets. My buddy, like one of my best friends just got out of the federal penitentiary. Um, Last, two weeks ago so he's he's gonna be he's gonna be you know hanging out and, and, and helping me with some music stuff but those are the people those are the people that i care about what they think because those are the people i want to reach and those are the people that are like yo like it's so cool you get to play at churches sometimes it's so dope that you're married and you ain't got to worry about your girl having a side man it's so like they think that being a christian is cool even though they're not christians because they see the fulfillment they see the joy they see the happiness and my entire life verse is, is Jesus said in John 10, 10, he says, the enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy. He says, I've come to give you life and life in the abundance. And I live an abundant full life. I'm not the richest dude in the world. I'm not, I'm not you know, the, the, the dopest rapper, but I live a very full, abundant, fulfilling life. And I think that's what we're actually after. I think beneath the surface, like people are after happiness and after these things. And so we're just medicating, whether it's like, yo, I'm gonna be promiscuous and have multiple relationships or, or not be committed or whatever. And then you see the ramifications of that. You see having someone that has multiple partners and multiple kids with multiple women. And well, how does that work out for you? You know what I'm saying? Like that's you seldom is, is a great unless you're really, really wealthy and successful. And so it's like, I think the practical benefits of the life that Jesus offers me way excel anything else that, 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 that I could have in the world. And that even just sounds cheesy stand like in the world, you know what I'm saying? But like, I'm just, I don't know, bro. Like I'm just happy. And it just makes sense on so many different levels. Like logically it makes sense to me. So you're going to hear that in my music. And I think a lot of people actually want that. We've just been force fed a lot. We've been force fed that like, yeah, you need to, you need to see if you have sexual chemistry with somebody and try to have sex with as many people as you can before you settle down. Like for what? Actually that shows that people who have a lot of partners end up having tougher times when they do settle down. They end up having dysfunctional sex lives when they do settle down. Like the, the research is already out there. You know what I mean? So it's like, I'm just happy, bro. Yeah. I mean, I've heard a lot of things you said that aren't, I mean, the, when you talk about the research, the research isn't even like religious research. It's just straight up research. It is what it is. So it is interesting that it does reflect with the things that you believe. I want to, and, and 
that can lead it to whole other side conversations. We might have to do something on that um, <laughs> these days. But I think that the fact that you're where you are right now is a great thing. But just being someone coming from the outside, especially if this is what re you're reflecting right now, initially, a lot of people are going to say, hey, that's BS. There'll be some people who are attracted to you, but then there's some people who was like, hey, all right, that, that's BS. But that's obviously because they haven't gotten the chance to see your journey leading up to where you are now, right? And I'm just, I'm sure you're talking about the household that you come, come from. There's been some interesting spaces that you've been in um, that just aren't, that you wouldn't go back to today. So I would love to hear a little bit about where you were before you really turned to God. I know it's not that type of interview, but I, I think it's important for your artist story. Yeah, I was in a spot, bro, where like again, I'm here. I am. I'm. I'm. I'm six. My dad leaves. I, I'm growing up in San Diego, Normal Heights, which at the time was like, it, it. You know, it was. It was very. It was. It was San Diego predominantly is like a very blood neighborhood. You know, so I, I'm growing up around dudes. Uh, I'm like the one black. Uh, I'm the one white kid in an entire black neighborhood. You know what I'm saying? And so there's the there's the allure of gang banging. There's the allure of drugs and smoking weed in the like the the height of like 90s gangster rap you know what i'm saying so like my first concert i think i'm like eight or nine years old i'm watching snoop in the chronic and dr dre tour at the san diego sports arena like this is like wow. my foundation in hip-hop you know what i said and uh and it was like it was it was a trip like it was a trip seeing that see it was, it was crazy growing up in the early 90s and so my dad left we were going to like Armenian, I'm, I'm half Armenian, half Russian. My, my Armenians are loosely Christian. So we were going to this Christian Armenian Orthodox church, more like a Catholic church, but it's Armenian Orthodox. So my dad left, my mom got, you know, became an alcoholic, or she already was an alcoholic. So she's now single mom, super duper depressed. The priest of that church ended up, I guess, remarrying my dad to my stepmom now. And we have an amazing relationship. I was over there last night. I love my stepmom, love my dad. Um, but my mom, just put a lot of crazy thoughts on my head and, and kind of was like, yo, F the church. How could they do this? Your dad left me. He technically never divorced me and da, 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 da. So, so my understanding of church and God was very, very dark, very, very negative because here's, is the single mother who gets abandoned by her, her husband. And now the church who's supposed to be looking out for her ends up remarrying him. Uh, on the surface, that all looked messy as I got older, I found out, you know, there's, there's more to the story than that. So yeah. by the age of 11, 12, I mean, I'm, I'm full on in my mind. I'm, I'm an atheist. That's I'm using that language. I don't believe there's a God. I don't believe there's, there's, there's purpose to the universe. How could there be? My life is a, is a train wreck, you know? Mm -hmm. And everybody is so, so weird. Everybody in my apartment complex, I grew up on 33rd and Adams in San Diego, California. Everybody in my apartment complex gets radically saved like radically converted. There was my best friend's mom who was pushing drugs. It got caught going to the airport with like cocaine, went to jail, got, got saved, came back. The entire complex got saved because of her testimony. You know what I'm saying? And I was the one kid that was like, no, that's all BS, y'all crazy. So literally everybody around me is saved and they're sharing the gospel with me. God loves you guys, you're gonna do great things. And then I ended up having to do, I got arrested when I was in, fifth grade breaking into houses i had to do community service i ended up doing the community service at their church you know what i'm saying so like but i'm still hardened i'm still hard to the gospel i'm still hardening to god i don't want nothing to do with god 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 doesn't exist as far as i'm concerned you guys are all crazy and then i moved to north county i got in trouble i was getting in a lot of trouble i moved to north county and north county is where i live now san marcos vista oceanside the north county of san diego county and it was a reset for me. I started playing basketball. I started hooping. I went to a completely different school, predominantly white school. Uh, it was like I was in a middle class area. We were still, you know, living in an apartment, all that kind of stuff. But I was all of a sudden in a middle class area and things just started to change. And man, my story is similar in that. Like I met a girl and the only way I could hang out with her on Sundays was to go to church with her and her family. So I was like, I'm gonna go to church, you know what I mean? But this church was completely different. This wasn't a Catholic or an Orthodox church. This was like, a, a, this like a, I guess you'd call it evangelical church. Like it was like, I understood what the pastor was talking about. The music was fly. There's a lot of cool people there. And 
after wrestling with God for another two years and, and really like studying every other religion, trying to understand what is the difference between Christianity and Islam? What is, it, what is Buddhism? What is Hinduism? What, what are all these different faiths? The question I kept struggling with, the question I kept wrestling with was, is Jesus God? Because he's either a liar, a lunatic, or he's Lord. And, and, I, and I read a book by Lee Strobel uh, called Case for Christ. I read, I'm like 15, 16 years old reading all this stuff. Right? Yeah, I read a book see, called right? uh, <laughs> The Evidence That Demands a Verdict. Uh, by, uh, oh, I can't remember his name, but it was a huge book. It was like an encyclopedia type book of like comparing every single faith. And I kept coming back to that, like, is Jesus God? Is Jesus God? And so finally it was like, yo, like either Jesus is God and he is who he says he is and who he claimed to be, or he's a complete liar and intentionally deceives people, which can't make him just be a good teacher, or he's crazy and he's out of his mind, which can't just be a good teacher and a good prophet if you're crazy and you're out of your mind. Those were the three options I was left with. And when I looked at history, when I looked at Paul, when I looked at how radical the world changed before and then after Jesus, I was like, yo, he, I don't co-sign everything that was done in his name, but he had to be who he claimed to be. And I, got, I, got, I gave my life to the Lord probably around 16, 17 years old. I was always doing music, but then I got cut from my junior varsity basketball team. So I was like, well, I'm just gonna do music. And before I know it, it just kind of compounded. I was like the rapper at school and I just kept getting better, bro. And then eventually I went to college, which in hindsight, I probably shouldn't have went to college, but I went to college, the internet era hit, MySpace hit, uh, you know, Twitter hit, YouTube hit. And I, you know, I figured it out, man. And I've been an independent musician, so yeah. Man, that's that's an interesting journey to go on um, at such an early age. That's wild. It was crazy, man. I, I've de I definitely have always felt like I'm an old soul, you know what I'm saying? Because I was into like this kind of stuff really young, you know, like really into like God and, and atheism and all these different things, you know? And I, f I feel like it gives me more balance, you know, like I got a friend right now who's a Satanist uh, and we, we have some really cool conversations. You know, I got another close friend that's an atheist, you know, we have some really cool conversations about this stuff. So I think it, it's, it gives me more perspective, I would say. Really? That's why I can't even imagine what you just said right there. Those conversations, like- Yeah, they're, they're fun. <laughs> <laughs> huh, yeah, we're not even gonna get into that. Um, so check this out, man. You, you have your own label but you're not, and you are, and you have an artist coming up under you. What do you think you feel like? What does someone? What does it even take to really say you have an artist under you and to actually make that artist successful when you're an artist yourself? Yeah, I think I think a lot of artists are afraid to sign people more talented than them, and so for me, that's always been the thing. Is I'm 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 okay with uh, if you look at the history of the artists that I've signed. Um, I've always signed artists more talented than me and never been afraid to give them my platform. So I think one, having vision, I think a lot of people will lack vision, you know, so they, they may have the mechanics of it, but they, they just don't know what's going on in terms of like having a vision for somebody else that's even bigger than for them, you know? Right. And so, uh, so yes, yeah, so I look at artists and I'm okay with people being more talented than me. I, I'm okay with people, uh, you know, going further than me. I'm, I'm completely okay with that. And so I think for me, uh, I think it has to start with vision. I think it has to start with like not being uh, intimidated by somebody else's talent. And then I would say for uh, having something to offer them, right? Like I don't, we don't do advances and, 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 and you know, here's 10 grand or whatever. Like we don't do that. You know what I'm saying? Because that, that's, to me, that's the debt system. And I don't, I don't like the major labels for that because they, you get in debt, you stay in debt your entire career is in debt you know what yeah. i mean and that's a lot of a lot of people don't know a lot of these major label artists are in debt to the labels and they're just hoping to recoup and then it's four or five albums later they still haven't recouped um and so i don't believe in that system so what i have to i had to figure out what is my value so one i could do so much of everything in house right we mix our own records in house we can record we have you know a professional studio in house so when i'm offering studio time i'm offering uh, mixing services. I'm offering video editing. I'm editing video for a lot of these projects. I have the dots and the relationships to find the photographer on the low, to find the designer on the low, to find the cinematographer, the video guy on the low. 
uh, or, or just outright do it myself. You know what I mean? If, there, if we don't have the budget for it, I'll just shoot it myself uh, okay. because that was my last job before I did music because I actually worked at my church as the video guy. So I could do a lot of video stuff, pretty, pretty inexpensive, you know, but I'm also, even that, like I'm trying to put people on to build up video guys and, you know, photographers and designers. And so I think you have to have something to offer them. And so for them, I may not be like, yo, I'm gonna put $10,000 on your project. Like, I don't have that, but one, I don't want them to feel indebted to me. I, but what I do have is time, I have experience, I have relationships and I have systems in place that can take a guy like Paul Russell uh, and build him up within a matter of three, four months, build him up to 2000 real active, engaged followers on Instagram, you know what I mean? And then once those 2000 hear his solo project, it's just gonna spread like wildfire, you know, because all you need, again, a thousand super fans, you know what I'm saying? You get a thousand super fans that really rock with you, they'll be your evangelist, not, you know, not to make the corny Christian tie in, but they'll be your evangelist, they'll go spread the message for you. And so that, that I would say that's what I have to offer and signing people more talented than myself is something that I've, I feel like I've always done and I've never been intimidated by. That's really interesting, especially being an artist, so many people have that ego to, to mm. sort of say, even say somebody's more talented to add talented than them. It's probably going to be hard for a lot of people. But if you want to also be a record exec per se, have your own label, you kind of need to sign people more talented. I mean, otherwise, yeah, it, it just wasn't work. I, I think um, the fact that you have a label and this is the only artist that you have right now. I have Paul Russell and I have John Keith. Uh, John Keith is amazing. He's an artist from uh, Southeast San Diego. Uh, really, really dope. He sings, he raps, he, he, he has the look, he acts. He, uh, he's, a, he's, a, he's a, you know, a, a black kid with naturally, natural blonde dreadlocks. And he sounds like a culmination of like, you know, Kendrick and Shmino and, and, and Chance a little bit. You know what I mean? He's, he's, he's a monster. He's a freak of nature. Like these kids, so good man and yeah i because uh, I, like i ha i'm aware that like i'm a white dude in hip hop so there's even certain things that like can work against me like the tonal quality of my voice may not sound as cool as somebody that you know grew up singing in church or grew up you know uh what with african american genetics that their their your voice just may sound cooler cuz you're black you know what i'm saying like i understand all these things and so uh not to you know be using very broad strokes uh but there are talent developed, meaning nurture, right? If somebody grows up singing and grows up in a musical household, I did not. Uh, and there's just genetics and natural, like Paul Russell just has an amazing voice. Like his voice just sounds good. The majority of our records together, he recorded on his iPhone. And people can't tell the difference. I recorded on my $3,000 Neumann. He recorded on his iPhone. That's how good he is. That's just God-given genetics, right? And then there's someone like John Keith who grew up singing in church. He grew up... With, with the vibe and the soul so he can come up with melodies super dope. You know what I mean? And the black church is really instrumental for all pop music, really, if we're going to go back yeah. to it and take music appreciation class, it all goes back to the black church. I, that's going to give somebody an advantage. I grew up singing Fred Hammond, you know what I'm saying? Singing these songs, these beautiful yeah. four part harmonies. You know what I mean? That's real. That's real. You, you mentioned being a white rapper, man. Do you think white rappers still have a hard time? I think the white privilege that white rappers have definitely outweighs whatever plight we have. As white rappers. <laughs> That's even I said, it's like, this, this is so funny to me. Uh, so yeah, like I, because I'm white, especially in the Christian space, but just because I'm white in general, like I'm viewed as more safe. I'm viewed as less risky. Um, you know what I mean? Like I definitely have advantages getting booked for shows. There's so many advantages just as a white male that I have that whatever disadvantage I may have, oh, I don't have the coolest voice. So oh, I didn't grow up in a musical household. You know what I'm saying? Oh, you know, hip hop is a black art, black culture. And so I'm trying to do a black art, you know, like uh, those are, those are minute in comparison of the advantages that I've had mm -hmm. uh, you know, growing up. Just, just being viewed as a white male. And I've never, like for me, it's been tough because I, I, I'm, my first language is Russian. Like my, you meet my dad, he looks Arab, you know what I mean? Like mm. I don't, I've never really like identified with white culture 
because I've always grow, grown up around black people and I'm, I'm an immigrant. I'm from Azerbaijan, Baku. I'm, I'm half Armenian. I'm a refugee. So I've always lived in this weird tension, you know, but uh, the society that we're in views me as a white male and I instantly have advantages because of that. Man, that's, that's, interesting. that's interesting to hear, particularly because you have that immigrant and black kind of mix versus actually being the more traditional white, but you said you still get those quote unquote advantages. This is how I personally see, like it's an abridged version of how I see the game for white rappers, right? Um, so let me know what you think about it, how you agree. Now, first you had a hard time for white rappers, very hard time. I mean, you had Vanilla Ice was like the poster boy of white rapper, right? You know, you had the Beastie Boys that did their thing, but that was like a, you know, that was a, an outlier. But then you have Eminem, right? Mm -hmm. And at first he had his hardships. He was coming up where he was. And he, it was hard because he was a white rapper and there was already a bad perception. But once he hits a certain threshold of awareness, now there's an advantage, right? Because now all these people that like hip hop music before, like little white kids that they, they see somebody who looks like them being a white rapper and all of them are naturally going to flock to them. Then you talk about whatever white male privilege exists, all of those kind of things. And then you talk about first mover advantage, basically where he's like the first, like super, super like dope, dope white rapper that was acknowledged on that level. And then next thing you know, you have like an icon, right? That's like, that's how I look at Eminem's story. Is and, and so anybody who disagrees with the first mover thing, it's the same thing with Obama being president. Obviously, mm -hmm. things work against him. He gets to a certain level. You get a lot of advantages, not necessarily the white privileged version of advantages, but you still get advantages just be, as far as your brand and acknowledgement being the first black president, right? You get a certain allure to you. Now, after Eminem did what he did and broke those planes, it's weird because there's nobody who's ever reached Eminem's level or close to it at to this day in terms of the white rapper side, but it has opened up a door of a lot of people who kind of sound like him, right? But then a lot of people, a, a, a lot of white rappers who are found a lot of success, but it's weird because I feel like the industry's cut up into a space where there could be, you could be a successful white rapper, but not be anywhere a part of the main culture in terms of black culture, like the, the one, the media, you, you don't have to be on BT or NXXL or Source or Breakfast Club. They don't even have to know who you are. Like none of those outlets have to know who you are, right? For a long time, a lot, a lot of people did not know who G Easy was, right? And it was only because I was one of my Asian friends moved out of San Francisco. I went to visit her, and she was playing G Easy stuff. I didn't even know G Easy was from San Francisco, like that area. So now it makes sense, like in hindsight, why she was the one who, who introduced. Her him to me but um like but they like him there's so many people that exist that are winning and having full careers without the acknowledgement or the okay of the black side of the culture that typically is known for run for running it right is that pretty much safe to say in terms of the white rapper perspective i know you don't fully relate to it and especially you have in all these additional like niches like christian so you're living a whole nother uh level of hardship but how, how do you feel about some of those observations? Yeah, I think I think you nailed it, bro. I think you really nailed it. And I think to to go a little deeper on that, I think that is the beauty of niches in the space that we're in, where like you can find people are looking for something. People are looking for themselves in the type of art they consume, right? So like, if I if I watch your videos, it's because I identify with you to some degree, right? Like mm -hmm. I see a, a bit of myself inside of you, and so therefore, I think that's how a lot of it works. And so I think you 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 talking about that is a testament to also just where we are with technology and where we are with culture. Where like I remember even Murs on Hip Hop DX did this thing called Hick Hick Hop, where it, it was like country Confederate flag hanging white dudes rapping and i just was like this is weird you know what i'm saying yeah. like yeah but i think that's where we are as a culture so that's cool that that that's dope you know what i'm saying but i think the tough part for me is that i think there still has to be a level of reverence for like bro this is black culture this is black art like i'm, I'm white but i'm a, i'm a guest 
You know what I'm saying? Like you have to be respectful of the space. Like you have, you have to have some type of framework and foundational understanding. And I think some white rappers, uh, aren't don't display that you know what i'm saying some some whether it's like iggy azalea and just you could just tell she's just kind of ditzy she doesn't understand like what this is you know she, there's no context of culture or uh you know a, a kid like Lil Zan saying that um tupac is boring you know yeah. what i mean and it's like bro like no 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 like you don't you don't get to make a social or musical critique of tupac ever like that's just it's just it's just be a rule like white rappers can't say anything negative about tupac ever you know what I'm saying? like so i think i think that's the that's the the disconnect yeah. like you don't uh, yeah it's interesting you you mentioned that little zan thing i didn't i didn't even thought about that comment before that he made i could i kind of just dismissed it at the time but just to think of the fact that he He's already younger, and then he doesn't relate to any of the. He does. He he doesn't understand. To, so to judge what he doesn't understand, it's just weird that his team even let him say <laughs> what he was saying. He like me trying to like dissect the Beatles catalog. Like, bro, like I'm so far removed as as a 16 year old. Like, I'm so far removed from the Beatles. Like, yeah. okay, I like a little U2. You know, like, like a little Coldplay. I don't understand the Beatles and what the cultural nuance and the significance was of what they were doing back then. Like, yeah. I, so I'm just going to be like, oh, yeah, they're legends. They're icons. Next question. You know? is, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Okay. One more on this subject, right? Post Malone is like the biggest white rapper right now, quote unquote. Um, but I'm. how do you what's your view of Post Malone and the way that he's moved throughout the game? Yeah, I think Post Malone is freakishly talented. I I like I like his music melodically. I think he does really cool stuff. I, I think it's even more interesting how he came up. I don't know if you saw the whole, like, he, he moved to L.A. with some uh, YouTube video yeah, yeah. gamers. Yeah. You know, and, and, yeah. and so I think even the way they try to tell that story, this rags to riches story, like, nah, like he has some homies that were doing YouTube full time, living in a mansion and he was living with them. So when he got ready to do music, I feel like there had to have been some type of outlets and platforms for him to get on, even if it's just building relationships with blogs or whatever, you know, whatever was popping at the time. Uh, so I think his story is interesting and the way they use technology and YouTube to get on is, is fascinating. I think you know what? I would agree with him, honestly, in that I don't think he's a rapper. Like, I've never saw him as a rapper. I, when I first heard him, I was like, oh, this is like, this is like T-Pain, you know? Like, this is like, this is like that way. Like, like mm -hmm. this is like a white T-Pain. I don't think T-Pain is a rapper. You know what I'm saying? I think T-Pain is a singer that makes hip hop, you know? So I think T-Pain or, or Post Malone is a singer that makes hip hop, you know? And so I... I, I agree, like, yeah, you're not really a rapper, you know, uh, but I guess those lines are getting blurred. I think some of his comments in terms of just like genres and all this kind of stuff, but I think I get it, but I think it's like, bro, you, you, you want to make diverse music, dope. Like you want to, you love country, dope. Like I'm not mad at any of that. Just don't like, just don't come into the space and poop on hip hop. Like don't, 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 don't poop on this culture. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. I, don't know, I just feel like we should be as white males. Like we should be the most empathetic and the most white males in hip hop. We should be the most sensitive, the most empathetic towards the plight of black people if you actually understand what hip hop is like, and I'm like, bro, I just told you like my, one of my best friends just got out of the feds. Like he did 10 years, you know what I'm saying? Before that he did five. He spent his entire adult natural life behind bars. I'm well aware of how the system works. I'm well aware of the revolving door. I'm well aware of, of like, so it's like, I'm so humble and empathetic towards the struggle of black people how could I ever say anything sideways or weird about like black culture or hip hop culture and be like, Oh, well, no, there's no more Sean. You know? So I, th I just think some of that stuff he said is just, I don't know. I think it's in poor taste at the least. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. I, I think I, I definitely agree with everything you said. I think my biggest thing when it comes to post Malone is there's a disconnect somewhere between maybe the things he's saying, but then, because he might say all these things about branding and I don't want this type of allure. I don't want to be a, a, a rapper. I don't want to necessarily be even hip hop. But when you look at, I don't know who, who did um, branded him and brought his image about, but it wasn't him. I'm pretty sure it wasn't him. It was a team around him. He was branded as a rapper or deep hip hop imagery wise. Like if you look at him when he was with the video gamers, 
the the short shorts, the goof. He was goofy. He was like the stereotypical goofy white guy. That white humor, all of that stuff. Yeah. Nothing wrong with it. I watched TV, like plenty of shows and stuff. Like I, I laugh. I thought that was funny too, right? But then you look at him, almost like instantly, he's this other image with the braids, the golds, and he's the like he's that image. So once you start to speak down on that culture and you see this instant change, it kind of feels like. I don't know. It starts to feel like you don't appreciate a culture that you're moving. And that's why people say stuff like culture virtual and things like that. Obviously he's talented. Nobody can deny he's talented and being talented and making dope music doesn't necessarily, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have a great perspective on what you're doing or how you go I think about it, your business. I think it's the team at Universal Republic. I think the label that he signed to, like that's he may right. say like, I don't make hip hop, but it's like, bro, like they're branding you as a hip hop artist. They're branding like, you. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Like, like, I think they know what they're doing. I think they yeah. know what they're doing. Like, I mean, he even started yeah. talking different, I mean, to be real, but like, it's, it's, it's very clear. So somebody has to make that decision and figure out how they, how they want to get him. But I mean, obviously his music is so good that it's outweighing a lot of those other issues. So it, so it's irrelevant, but I don't yeah I don't I don't really put a lot of that stuff on the artist like a lot of people do. Maybe I should do a video on it, but um, <laughs> but it's definitely some somebody on the team where there's some intentional moves that are a complete contrast to the stuff that he says, which has just been weird with them. Um, but cool, I, it's real dope to get your opinion and your perspective on that. Getting back to some of the things when it comes to you, man, like your style is typically more lyrical, right? Um, if I think about the Indy Jones 2 project, definitely a little bit more lyrical. And then when I think about the joint project, well, was that supposed to be like a, co a full collab, right? The Via Text, you and Paul Russell? Yeah. It's a little bit more laid back. It feels more like a collaboration. doesn't feel like anybody's trying to necessarily super outshine um, one or other or go hard. But your, your, your solo projects, you're more of a you, – you seem to like you have a I go hard type style, if that makes sense. Um, what makes you as an artist more of a lyrical um how do I want to say this what makes you go the, the the lyrical route more versus trying to open up and be a lot more melodic you have people on your choruses and things like that and you have some pretty dope choruses right like I know the one um, I think it's cool it's cool something you have like two songs I really love the chorus um but it doesn't seem like you put too much effort in but, or too much too much energy into the actual course as far as saying I got to be that guy. You just leave it. You do your lyrics and then you'll bring in a dope singer or you'll have a nice course, but it's all about them lyrics. What leaves you as that in an age where you could be blowing up and making viral songs on a bigger playing field at this point? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, man, self-awareness. <laughs> like, okay. I know that uh, I'm not the melodic guy, you know, as much as I would love to be. Like, I would love to do real cool melodies and all that kind of stuff. I'm, I'm just not, I'm not that guy. And I, maybe I need to spend a season, you know, getting vocal training and trying to become that, you know, working on that side of things. I'm just, yeah. I'm not that guy. So instead of like trying to do, like if I did auto-tune, auto like I don't, don't think I'm in a space right now where I have the natural talent or the natural spark of like, you know, whoever, a Post Malone or Travis Scott, these guys, they got like really clever melodies and all that kind of stuff. So I just rather focus on my strengths and focus on the things that I'm good at. And then if I need to bring in someone who can do that and execute that vibe, like I got a song on Indy Jones 2 called Hyena. And so I, uh, my man, Keyshawn, you're welcome. Keyshawn did the chorus and you know it was that like that vibe and it was that's i think that, that sounds kind of like not john legend-esque is that that song no this this one's way more like ratchet like this is on some like uh some some, 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 some travis scott you know real real auto -tune. oh yeah 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 okay yeah yeah about is a song with manny wells that's the song with manny wells the thing i did a uh, song i did is winona's song that song i did yeah. to my sister um so yeah he, he so yeah so like i'd rather bring in someone that could actually pull off that vibe and kill it and that's their thing instead of me trying to, to, to do something that's that's not me um it's just, it's just not like I, I can't really sing like that you know what i'm saying I, i've tried bro like in college i took i mean i was a choir i was taking vocal training like i was really trying and i just i just you know but i can i can give you these bars though you know yeah. what i'm saying like I can, I can rap but i think uh may, i think maybe that's an advantage at times you know like maybe people like that i i i, I 
I'm the rapper that doesn't sing and rap because now everybody sings and raps, you know, and I'm mm-hmm. that doesn't sing and rap. I just, I just rap. And then I bring in the fly singers or the auto tune dudes to, to, to add that color and that texture when, when I'm ready. And so, yeah, I mean, I think, I think it just, just self-awareness, you know what I'm saying? Like I know what I'm not good at. And right now I'm not good at, doesn't say I won't get good at, maybe I will, but I'm just, it's just not my lane, you know? Got it. So, so back to the business, man. Do you guys use Superphone? I love Superphone, bro. Superphone is uh, everything. That's the first line of defense for me. So yeah, he actually reached out to me and told me I'm one of the top 77 users of Superphone or top 70 users of Superphone or something like that. So yeah, I have a very like, you know, personal touch with all my audience. Um, um, I think I have about almost 2000 people in my Superphone contacts. And I, I'd be really on a super phone. Like I check it every day. I'd be texting with people, you know what I'm saying? Um, doing all kinds of stuff. The super phone has been really helpful in just getting the information out. And then like we do stuff like, uh, like this week, I don't know if you saw, but we did a flash hoodie sale. So for 24 hours, we did $25 hoodies, but you had to be on my super phone to get the secret link. You know what mm-hmm. I'm saying? And yep. then Paul Russell accidentally leaked the link in his Instagram bio and he didn't understand what was going on. It's just like, whatever, just all right, links out there. You know what I mean? <laughs> uh, so we were able to do something like that. We have 24 hours, $25 hoodies. Um, and we sold 80 hoodies, you know what I'm saying? Or I think we sold a little more than that. I got to check. I'm actually going to go to LA right now and go buy all the blanks and get ready to, you know, fulfill that order. The super phone gives me the ability to mass text everybody and be like, yeah. boom, this is happening. You know what I'm saying? And I think the personal connection, like I'm, I'm like my entire thing, the entire Andy Jones philosophy is I'm trying to do opposite of what everybody's trying to do. So like rappers are trying to be cool and mysterious in Hollywood. And it's like, nah, I'm gonna reply to every single comment on my Instagram. I'm gonna reply to every single DM. I'm gonna reply to every single text message. I'm trying to be as normal as possible because I, I'm using that as a, as a way to distinguish myself, you know, from a branding standpoint, but then also from a, uh, just a, a, a marketing standpoint, because I'm always, it's to a level, there's always content. Me sending somebody a text message is a degree of content. Me replying to a text message is a degree of content. And it's small enough where, I mean, there's only 2000 people. I'm probably getting a couple dozen text messages a day. It's not that hard for me to set aside 40 minutes and reply to all my, all my super phone contacts or my, all, all my DMs, you know what I mean? But that's very intentional. It's doing the opposite of how other rappers are trying to come off. So I figured that you had to be using it just because I've seen you, you know, request for texts and things like that before. And it's interesting that you said content because that is a great way to think about it. Me saying, yo, what's up, man? Like, how you doing? That's still content in its own, its own way. Or yeah, that was dope. I appreciate it. Like that's that small exchange is content, right? And relationship, Ryan Leslie, um, he talks about relationships being about proximity and frequency. Mm. And that's all that is like us staying connected because you look, you have, you get create distance between any relationship and then there's no frequency in the contact. Like you, you lose that just point blank. And I know a lot of people try to play with that when it comes to, you know, that mystique and whatever, all that stuff. But if you don't have a lot of money behind you, it's really hard to maintain that and always have to chop and manage that that becomes a thing to manage in itself so like yeah and i think you, you you said it well uh i watched your producer grind interview i don't know how old that was but it was around the time of your festival uh, i actually just watched it recently and you said that branding is like the, the 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 expression of who you are like your brand like almost like you know a halloween costume you know what i'm saying yeah. like you wear marketing is releasing content and building that rapport with people Yep. You know, and so I think sometimes we over, we just, we confuse the two all together. That was actually one of the cleanest definitions I've ever heard. I was like, man, this man, killing it. And so for me, it's like, I have a specific brand. I am the advocate for indie hip hop, you know what I mean? Being independent, being free. Uh, at the same time, I'm creating content to support that brand and to continue that, like you said, that frequency of relationship. And Ryan Leslie is, is a genius in his own right for developing the whole idea. And yeah, so, so dope. I'm, I'm surprised that thing isn't bigger yet because it's, it, it at some point it's going to hit and it's going to hit hard, but he's been rolling it out really slowly. I actually had Super Bowl for, I had it for a decent period of time, but I had to use it differently because it's not on Android yet. And I have an Android. So I had to go ahead and cancel it for the time being. I don't know if I'm gonna get an iPhone so I can use it because it's so useful, or if yeah. I'm on, yeah, I don't know what, or just wait for the Android release. But 
Yeah. I'm curious to see how Superphone scales to the bigger artists. Like, I would be curious to see how many contacts does Ryan have? How how does it? How personal can he get it? Because from what I've heard, um, I think Andy Minio, who has, I think he has half a million Instagram followers and Social Club. Uh, I think Social Club is like 100,000, 150,000 Instagram followers. They're both on, uh, you know, bigger platforms. They, I don't think it works for them. I don't think they could scale it at the same way, like where for smaller mid you know, uh, middle income level artists, I think it's a really big advantage, but I think on that next level, like if you got a hundred thousand super phone contacts, like, or Joyner Lucas is on super phone, right? Like yeah. how does, how does that even work? Like how yeah. do you, like you, you, you're not replying to everybody. And then it just feels like another bot. Now it just feels like another, like, exactly. You know, I, know. I would love to work with one of those artists on that scale, like just that specific project kind of project to figure out how to make that work because I think it can, but it has to be some thought put behind it. I remember one of the people on the team telling me that they had some stuff for Cardi B on it, but I don't, I didn't get a chance to figure out what they did, but it probably was more of a one off project versus mm -hmm. the ongoing relationship building, like what you use it for. Uh, but well, dope, man. So, what you're using Superphone, and obviously that's. Like it sounds like it's a core of your marketing and, and, and your marketing system. What does your marketing system really look like? You use Superphone as some back end technology. Are there any other things that you use outside of just being YouTube, Instagram? Yeah, YouTube, Instagram, and recently Patreon. So essentially, my YouTube, my Superphone is a funnel to try to get pay people on Patreon because that recurring subscription, you know what I'm saying? Uh, so I think we're at 61 Patreons. We started it. July, something like that, which like, I'm, I'm pretty stoked with the growth. You know what I'm saying? We have a couple bigger givers on there. Um, so I love Patreon. I love the idea of having a subscription method and, and kind of creating and tailoring content for those very, very core. Those would be like your super fans, right? Like the people, you know, so my goal is like to build Patreon. Once we get that to a hundred people to develop uh, our, our podcast more. And so like I told you, like, you know, I'm using some of the equipment right now using uh, multiple cameras on a podcast, a video switcher, scaling content. You know, I love this, what you're doing here. I got to figure out how to do with software using for this because I think this is super dope to uh, do interviews like this because I can do so many interviews with people. You know what I'm saying? If I knew that I could do this and it looks this great, like you look super clean on your end, you know, and I have my camera connected. So I think that opportunity, but yeah, uh, to get back to your question. Um, so yeah, marketing is Instagram, really good photos for Instagram really taking time to learn Instagram. Right now I'm learning Lightroom. I'm understanding LUTs. Um, my, my roommate who lives in the studio upstairs, in the bedroom upstairs, he's a photographer, videographer. He's incredible. So um, he takes most of my photos, but we're trying to really understand like the, 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 the lighting, the, you know, all that kind of stuff, uh, the LUTs, the Lightroom. So one natively doing that. And then YouTube for me is a way to one, do podcasts and have like long form conversations like this, where like we just dropped an hour long live stream, multiple cameras on the King stream YouTube page. Um, and people watch that. Right. And they love it. And they're like, this is incredible. But then we'll also do smaller segments. We'll take that live stream, we'll condense it down and we'll scale it on my YouTube channel. So we just dropped a video today um, or yesterday, Halloween, pagan evil or do christians need to chill and it's an entire video of me telling christians like y'all y'all like all of our holidays have pagan roots like stop tripping you know what i'm saying y'all need to chill like with this whole like halloween's evil like what chill you know and so now there's you know so i took one hour long piece of content scaled it down to a six seven minute video put it on my youtube page and so scaling stuff like that i think is pretty cool um and so youtube is like i'm trying to add as much value as i can and then also do as much conversation and challenging specifically Christians to think outside of the box. So we're talking about, you know, our tats, why tattoos aren't a sin, why y'all need to chill with Halloween is it, can someone, can someone smoke weed and not be in sin? Like controversial topics that a lot of people are asking. I want to create dialogue and really just pe force people to, to, to think critically. Cause I'm sure in your experience with some Christians, like you can really get sucked into the vortex of like group think, uh -huh. and, and that's low key how we elected Donald Trump, right? A lot of Christians was like, yeah, he's a conservative, like yeah. chill, he's not, you know what I mean? Like, and I'm trying to get people to think critically about these, these different topics, you know? Yeah. And so that's the YouTube platform. Sometimes we scale that to Instagram, usually we don't. And then the super phone and then trying to funnel people into Patreon. Um, because I think that's, to me, that's the big, uh, 
uh, revenue stream that I see that I could really pop off. I got, I got a couple of buddies on Patreon. One of my best friends on Patreon and his revenue streams is like almost like he's going to be probably at, what is it? Four, five, three, but he'll be up five figures. You know what I'm saying? Probably within the next year or something on Patreon, you know, right. which is crazy. And then, yeah, so it's just trying to diversify those revenue streams. So Patreon, the web store was just doing amazing after we did this hoodie sale, understanding flash sales, uh, uh, obviously Spotify, Apple Music, Distro Kid, that money, you know, comes in. Sync licensing is is, is amazing. If, if, if indie artists, I tell all indie artists, like if you're broke and you just started, lease your beats. If you got a spark and you got some momentum going, learn to produce your own beats or get your own producer because sync licensing is huge for, you know, like we've had our, you know, one of our songs is on a Penny Hardaway commercial, uh, Adidas commercials, all these different things, or just a small YouTube or wedding vlog. All these different things add up. And so sync licensing is a legit revenue stream. So diversifying those revenue streams and considering where, uh, where and how to get more people really behind what we're doing. Tell them about sync licensing real quick. I mean, just as your experience as an, as an artist, because one thing I know about that sync licensing check, man, is it's a good check and the work for it is different than having to go grind out some shows or build a fan base. You can have no fan base at all and get a few sync licensing checks. I know I've known people who got the five, 10 K checks and literally have zero fans. Yeah. Yeah. Sync licensing. Again, it's another one of those things that kind of levels the playing field because it's really about the quality of your music and if it works in a in a specific format, a commercial, a movie, a TV show, whatever. Sync licensing historically for me has always been about like a lack of relationships. Like I just didn't have the relationships. And then somebody plugged me with Musicbed, who's the premier sync licensing platform, like for like upper echelon you know, films and, and stuff like that. And they just liked our music. They take all of our music now. Well, they take most of our music now and they, they show a lot of love, man. And so they're, they're super dope. Um, so they have a web portal where you, like the average YouTuber can go sync license music. And uh, randomly enough, I found like one of my homegirls does like a beauty vlog. She has like a million Instagram subscribers. She's super popping. And like, she like used one of my songs tagged me in it and I was like and then I found out she did through music bed and I was like oh that's dope like you could have just asked me I would have been like yeah that's a great shout out just her posting my song in an Instagram clip I picked yeah. up a bunch of like you know little girl followers which is hilarious you know uh but, but music bed facilitated that I didn't facilitate that they took care of the payment um music bed if you do a deal with them for me it's an exclusive 50 50 split you know we just do right down the middle and uh and yeah you're right a song from four years ago and literally this literally happens i have a wedding song on an album called do for one i wrote a song about being married uh called good thing a song from four or five years ago gets synced today sometimes it's a 50 dollars sync sometimes it's a 300 hundred dollar sync you know sometimes it's more than that all that stuff culminates and so music bed i would you know check check for music bed they're they're very particular i think they reject like 98.5 percent of everything that's submitted to them but um they're, they're super dope. And, and between me and you, uh, well, not me and you and the people watching this video, like I haven't done a show since, I can't even remember the last time I did a show, July? My last show was, a, it was in July. You know what I mean? It's, nice. it's about to be November, you know? So like, I don't have to do shows. A lot of that is because of Patreon and Musicbed and, and Sync Licensing. Nice. It's, it's really dope that you've just been able to develop this legitimate income stream from your music. And with that being said, man, you being where you are right now as, you know, someone who owns a label, as an artist that's self-sufficient in their own right, and someone who has another artist on, what does planning look like for you? What's your plan for the rest of 2018 and going into 2019? Because I know you have a strategy. Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, 2018, we're putting out the John Keith record. Uh, what we did with John Keith's new album is as I'm mixing it, we had... Uh, we have the album cover, but we have like eight different album titles or like mocks of text or whatever. There's three or four different titles. We put all that up on on uh, Patreon and we're letting our Patreons vote for his album title, trying to make it interactive. You know what I'm saying? So like they're voting on the album title right now. Uh, we're mixing that. That uh, will hope should be out before the year's out. I'm, I'm guessing uh, maybe around Black Friday, maybe after that. So a whole nother thing, music videos for that, dropping content for that. Right after that, I'll probably come with Indy Jones 3 um, in, I think in January-ish. I'm not, I'm not quite sure. And then a Paul Russell solo record, which is going to be incredible. He already's been working on it. I've been able to get ahead 
on music videos. We've been able to get ahead on these projects. So like a lot of this stuff's already done. It just needs to be mixed for the most part, you know? So Paul Russell record. Uh, and then we're going to do some shows. So I think we're doing a week on the East coast. We're going to go from Toronto, Boston, Queens, maybe all the way South as a, uh, Virginia. Maybe if we get if we book Virginia, we might go all the way to Atlanta and just do like a week, week and a half all over the East Coast. Do a spring, summer West Coast tour, um, and then get back to. Paul will be done at Cornell. Hopefully, he'll move to California. I think what we might try to do, and I'm not quite sure yet, is we might just try to do uh, a, a couple of different singles where every week maybe we'll drop a different single from an artist, or every other week, really cool videos, and and see how we can work those. You know, for a season. And then before we go back into album mode, uh, I, I'm sure you're familiar with Toby Nguigby. Uh I love what he's been able to do with his his um, his weekly videos. Before yeah. or around the time he started, I was doing these videos called weeklies, where I was doing a live one take video rap, like almost like a BT cipher type vibe. But I was out in different environments. We we're doing one takes, yeah. um, and I, we, me and me and Zach, my video guy, we did 24 of them for like 24 weeks straight. And dude, it was it was so grueling uh, it was the, it's the hardest thing i've ever done having to yeah. write a song every week memorize a song every week and deliver it in one take every week it was super hard but it built the hype and the buzz and the excitement and then i dropped indy jones one pretty much on the back end of all those songs and then i was like i can't do this this is too hard i can't i can't do the label thing and do shows and so i was like you know we're gonna stop but i want to bring back something like that i like the idea of weekly content yeah. and but maybe not using live audio because if we could punch and we could cut then it'll take us 30 minutes to shoot a video and way less time to memorize it you know versus yeah. like having to do a one take so that's kind of what i'm thinking for 2019 man some more shows uh and re really thinking through how we release the content the podcast you know how i want to have i want to have you on a podcast having better guests on a podcast consistently covering everything from god to faith uh, to hip hop culture, to health and fitness. I've been on a crazy fitness journey. I just lost a bunch of weight and, you know, goal is to get to 10% body fat. I think that's another thing that most hip hop artists aren't talking about. We're not sh sharing the information, you know, on how to get there nutritionally. So touching on all these different things to really help people understand, like, what is a full life look like? What does an abundant life look like? Maybe, maybe you're not sure about the Jesus thing. Maybe you're not a all the way there but you see like yo like these guys are happy they love their wives they have kids they're making money they're successful maybe there's something to their world view you know what i'm saying let me let me dig a little deeper you know dope dope man that sounds great and i, I would love to see that weekly content thing of some sort between the three of you even if it's not the same person but at least right and i think that's how we'll be able to scale it right because if yeah. it's somebody every other week yeah it's way easier than me having to do 26 in, in a row you yeah. know what it is. you get that terrible label, bro. brand that label at the same yeah. time every single time yeah. but you also yeah. to start building a culture around that way that's dope man well hey i don't want to keep you for too much longer man i really appreciate the conversation you've been super valuable to the audience i already know is there any last thing you want to leave people with uh man make sure y'all subscribe to, to to brand man sean i'm like a fan so when you, you hit me with this dm i was like yo like <laughs> i was like told my wife i was like i gotta do this interview like i was super excited so make sure y'all subscribe to this youtube channel because i besides you curtis king uh i see very few people adding this much value to independent artists on youtube and i think it's a huge need right now uh because there's a huge huge opportunity to, to do it took me 10 years to get to where I'm at. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I've been full time over three, but I think if you guys are listening to this stuff, Brand Man Sean was talking about, I'm sure we'll do stuff like this. I'll have them on my podcast. I think a lot of people right now who have a spark, we, I think we could see way more chance to the rappers. I think we could see way more Macklemore's and then we yeah. could see way more guys, you know, on a smaller indie boutique level like myself, getting to a place where you're living off of your art and enjoying it. And you're not, you may not be the richest dude in the world. Like I ain't got, I ain't got my Tesla X yet. You know what I'm saying? But like, man, I'm, I'm happy. I drive a Prius. My wife has a car. Like we good. You know what I'm saying? And I think people can do that off of hip hop music if they subscribe, listen, and follow the advice that you're giving through this platform. So salute to you, man. That's what's up, man. I appreciate it, man. We're definitely gonna put all your social medias, you know, on the on the clip, but if you have any specific action items or places you want them to start to check them out, go ahead and let people know. 
yeah, yeah. What we'll do is we'll link up. I'll send you the link to the uh, how to get discovered on Spotify video. I think that'd be the easiest on ramp for them to to your audience to kind of see what like the, the, the more linear tips that I give on the Spotify thing. Bet, bet, love it, man. Well. Hey, as always, everybody, if you like the video, go ahead and hit that like button. If you like it, you might as well share it. And if you're not subscribed, you know what to do. Hit that subscribe button.